years ago, I was uh, invited by uh, Santa Clara County Supervisor Dave Cortese to offer the invocation at the meeting of our Board of Supervisors. And this is what I offered at that time. It is a version of the 67th Psalm, um, adapted from the Hebrew um, by Stephen Mitchell and um, messed with by me. But I stayed fairly close to Stephen's inspiration. Lord, bless us with your peace. Make your light shine within us. Let your presence be known and your love appear to all. Let earth honor you and all people shout your praise. Christian, Muslim, and Jew, Hindu, pagan, agnostic, the SBNRs, Buddhist, Taoist, scientist, black, brown-skinned, yellow and white, gay, trans, straight, old, young, Democrat, Republican, independent. Let wisdom speak in our hearts and justice light up our eyes. Let wisdom speak in our hearts and justice light up our eyes. Let all of us feel your presence and sing out in the fullness of joy. Psalm 67 by Stephen Mitchell and some changes from me. I'm so grateful to be with you today and to have this opportunity to connect with you and to feel the rising of spirit among us in our community. Like so many here in the U.S. and globally, I have been stirred to a deeper contemplation and a call to action amidst the rising tide of protests against systemic racism, police violence, and pervasive injustice that has been laid bare by the brutal racist murder of George Floyd and too many others. I've been in prayer night and day. I've been in prayer night and day, a prayer without ceasing. So you might wonder, how do we do that? Pray without ceasing. Well, we turn our hearts and our minds to God. And we ask sincerely and wholeheartedly. We expect God to answer. As Paramahansa Yogananda said, we demand it. We demand an answer. And then I find that the prayer begins to turn me. The prayer begins to turn us. And for me, prayer is a way of listening and something will arise in my mind and my consciousness that um, will act as uh, like a divining rod that will lead me to a deeper insight and guide my steps forward. So sometimes that takes the form of a mantra of some words from scripture or it may be a song or an image. But I listen, I look to what is stirring my heart, tweaking my conscience. And during this time, what has come in response to my prayer has been a song written by Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan. And many of you perhaps have heard it sung by Sweet Honey in the Rock, and it's called Ella's Song. And it goes something like this. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, no. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. So that has been playing again and again in my heart and in my mind as a prayer day and night, and I have been in inquiry, what is the call of this prayer, and what does it mean to me, what does it mean to us, and what does it mean 
with regard to our spiritual path of Kriya Yoga and its practice? Well, the connection to me is obvious that freedom, liberation is the goal, the purpose of our practice of Kriya Yoga. And we understand that liberation as liberation of consciousness, meaning the freedom to live in the soul, to no longer be restrained by old habits and patterns, wrong ways, error ways of thinking based on mm, wrong information or past experience. The ability to follow the guidance of the soul as we live rather than be swayed by outer circumstances or the patterns in our own mind. It is freedom from ignorance and ultimately it is freedom from sorrow. So while of course this liberation this spiritual liberation is something that we all must seek individually. It cannot be done in isolation because in accordance with our teaching, there is no such thing as isolation. We are one. We are one. And that is why ahimsa or nonviolence is the foundation for the practice that culminates in samadhi, the realization of oneness, starts with non-violence, non-harming, which is fulfilled only by love. It gives me great hope and strengthens my spirit at this time to feel the master's and indeed, I would say any saint worth his or her samadhi to be standing with us in this moment in our history. Paramahansa Yogananda notes in his seminal book, The Autobiography of a Yogi, that the intention that Mavatara Babaji put forth for this lineage of Kriya Yoga, which I stand in, which I teach, in which many of you are, of course, a part of, that Babaji said that Kriya Yoga is to inspire nations to forsake wars, to forsake race hatreds, to forsake religious sectarianism, and to forsake the boomerang evils of materialism. So we are right in alignment with the intentionality of this path of enlightenment that is an awakening for us to live in the world in peace and in true recognition of who we are, who everyone is in the light of spiritual truth. In times of trials, I often turn to the words of Mahatma Gandhi and a little uh, favorite book that I actually love so much that I have uh, loved off the covers. <laughs> I stuck the cover inside so I can show you that torn up cover that is called Mohan Mala, um, a Gandhian rosary, and it's the sayings of Gandhiji. And the one that I often return to when I'm troubled, and when I'm troubled about the world is this, and it actually begins the book. I do dimly perceive that whilst everything around me is ever changing, ever dying, there is underlying all that change a living power that is changeless, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves, and recreates. That informing power or spirit is God. And since nothing else I see merely through the senses can or will persist, God alone is. And is this power benevolent or malevolent? Malevolent. I see it as purely benevolent, for I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. And in the midst of tru untruth, truth persists. 
In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence, I gather that God is life, truth, light. God is love, the supreme good. And I return also to the Bhagavad Gita. saying of Lord Krishna, whenever dharma declines and the purpose of life is forgotten, I manifest myself on earth. I am born in every age to protect the good, to destroy evil, and to reestablish dharma. These statements of faith bring to mind for me also the quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who offered in 1968 this quote that has been often quoted again by President Barack Obama. We shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. These powerful statements are all hopeful, but must not be used to lull us into a kind of complacency in which we think that if dharma will rise, if truth will continue to rise, if the arc of the universe is inclined to bend towards justice, then it will just happen. That statement that Dr. King made famous and now echoed by President Obama, was first uttered in 1853 by a Unitarian minister, a transcendentalist, and an abolitionist, Dr. Theodore Parker. And I want to read to you how he said it, because it's really important to understand the origin of this. Reverend Parker said, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The ark is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. Truth, dharma, and justice are all inclined to rise, but they require our cooperation. We must divine it by conscience. Conscience is the still small voice within us. It is, it is what brought that chant, that song to my mind in prayer to keep me contemplating what I must do. I must not just rest back and imagine this is going to carry on without my participation. It is not so. So conscious is that still small voice of God within us, the benevolent power and presence that stirs us and speaks in our heart. In his most recent address to the nation, President Obama added a most significant caveat to that statement. And it just had me sit up and pay attention. He said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And then he added, we bend it. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice because we bend it. Writer and activist James Baldwin was in a conversation with famed anthropologist Margaret Mead, and they were wrestling with the question of responsibility, which is a question I think we all must wrestle with and are wrestling with today. And I want to quote from that conversation that was called A Rap on Race and with what James Baldwin said. He said, the police in this country make no distinction between a black panther or a black lawyer or my brother or me. 
The cops aren't going to ask me my name before they pull the trigger. I'm part of the society and I'm in exactly the same situation as anybody else, any other black person in it. If I don't know that, then I'm fairly self-deluded. What I'm trying to get at is the question of responsibility. And here he's reflecting on, at that time, recent terrors. I didn't drop the bomb that killed four black schoolgirls in Birmingham, and I never lynched anybody. Yet, I am responsible, not for what has happened, but for one, what can happen. I am responsible not for what has happened, but for what can happen. And we all are. It's an awesome responsibility. And it is part of our spiritual awakening, part of our spiritual journey. And one that it is time for us to engage in deeply and profoundly. So in the weeks ahead, I'll continue to share inspiration and steps for action with you in accordance with spiritual principle. But the first one today is pay attention, pay attention to the stirring of conscience. Pray, pray, and expect to receive an answer, expect to receive guidance, demand it, listen, pay attention, inquire, study, be informed, read, watch, be educated, and search your spiritual tradition, your religion of origin for inspiration and guidance. Have conversations, have difficult conversations with your friends, with your family, with your community, and examine yourself, your communities, and have it be your goal to interrupt, to end racism, and act. And throughout it all, pray and pray. Notice Dharma arising and how God is responding to your prayer. I want to close with telling you, as I had that song playing in my mind as a mantra leading me through this time, I thought, well, it would be so great to be able to share it with you, to offer it uh, at our satsang. But I couldn't quite figure out how to do that because the version I heard was a choral <laughs> rendition, and I didn't know who was going to do that. And it just turned out, through God's grace, of course, through God's grace, that Sharon reached out to us and said, I'm available for music if you like. And still then, I didn't believe it could be done. But when I spoke with Sharon, I said, you know, this song has been in my heart. And she said, you know, it's been in mine too. So Sharon is going to offer this song for us that is called Ella's Song. And... I was going to read the words, but I think you'll be able to hear them just fine as Sharon sings them to us. Mm -hmm. 